There we are. Hot off the press. Literally. Not that hot. I expected it to be hotter to the touch. Yeah. Well, it's small, so it's going to cool quickly. Mark. Yeah. A ton of them on the table. <laughs> tables. But we can actually see how hot that gets. Yeah, it didn't get hot. Still feel a little yeah, warm to but it. not not as hot as I thought it would be. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, it's so small. Is this sharp? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The uh, the build plate is uh, 100 degrees C, and the extruders are about 212 uh, Celsius. That's the melting point of the plastic. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. So welcome everybody to this TechBytes presentation on 3D printing. My name is Corey Bergeron. I think you guys know me. Um, we got this 3D printer a few years ago as part of a grant. And explicitly it came with the instructions to play with it. Those were the directions in the grant, to play with it. So uh, we've been doing that. Um, I make no claims to any expertise in 3D printing, it's just that I've had it to play with for a couple of years, and so I've, I've figured a few things out. So what we're going to talk about is a little bit of the history of the technology, the different kinds of printers there are, and the uh, uses to which they're being put and to which they may yet be put in the future. Uh, this is a technology that is uh, very much on the rise, on the increase, although it's not particularly new. Um, 3D printing really goes back to the mid-80s when the first patents were created. Um, computers got small enough and powerful enough to control machines and uh, do so in a fairly sophisticated way. And um, the, the, the first stereolithography process was uh, patented in 1986. Stereolithography is a way of using a laser that's steered by a computer uh, to solidify a liquid uh, polymer resin and do it a layer at a time, and a layer at a time, and a layer, layer at a time. Um, I, I guess it might help to distinguish uh, 3D printing or additive manufacturing from traditional manufacturing or subtractive manufacturing. Uh, traditional manufacturing is kind of like sculpting in wood or metal or stone, where you start with a block of stuff and then hack away the bits you don't want to leave you with the, the finished shape. 3D printing is more like sculpting with clay except instead of sticking random blobs on and kind of smoothing them out and all that, you do it like you did in kindergarten where you roll out a snake of clay and you make a circle and you roll out another snake and you put that on the next layer and the next layer and the next layer until you've got the candy dish or the, the ashtray as it was in my day. Um, 3D printing is the same thing where you build up an object layer by layer by layer and if you take a look at the things that are scattered around on the table, you look closely at them, you can see the layers. And this particular kind of uh, a printer um, doesn't do overhanging stuff very well. If you take a look at the minion, you can see that his, his eyes are a little droopy because there's no support built up underneath it. Um, if we take a look at this, you can see that the globe here, because it has some overhanging stuff, it had to have some lattice work built in. And the computer figures that out. And, and calculates how to do that automatically. And then after you finish building it, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll pull that support material away. They also have a kind of plastic that's water soluble that if you have a two extruder machine like this one, you can have one of the extruders build the, the lattice work out of water soluble material that you just then rinse away after the piece is done. That's kind of a cool thing. Um, I don't yeah. Questions in between, but sure. Like when you um, you're going to print something and you know you're going to have overhang, maybe it helps to print it upside down. Or, or in other words, you have a 3D thing. That, is is there a way of optimizing that so you have the least overhang possible? Yeah. Um, so here's a fishing lure that I just downloaded off of Thingiverse.com, and here in the uh, the the. the uh, a replicator G software, which is the software, it's a free software that uh, turns a 3D object into a printable model. Um, you can rotate this thing, and originally it came out um, downloaded uh, like that. No, not, not like that. 
um, on its side. And I could see that that was going to be a problem, so I just rotated it to put the flat side down, and that'll print a whole lot better than having all this, this, this uh, build stuff. But this is you doing it as opposed to being automated. Right, right. It's, it's me making the decision on how I want to do it. Uh -huh. So uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, there were a number of different technologies uh, designed and patented. Those patents began to expire around the turn of the century. So uh, hobbyists and tinkerers got a hold of the technology and started playing around with it. And around 2004, the idea of a RepRap, a self-replicating machine, took hold in the open source community. And the whole idea was to design an open source machine that could make a copy of itself. That was the, that was the goal. It didn't, hasn't quite turned out that way, but they've gotten fairly close. And the plans for the MakerBot were available freely on the internet, and all the parts are off the shelf. And then uh, MakerBot got kind of full of itself. And the company uh, had a lot of internal drama, and a lot of the original founders left the company with a good deal of animosity and acrimony. Um, and the company took some of its technology private and made it proprietary, and that caused an absolute uh, 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 uproar in the industry. Uh, the, the, the industry, the, the community was outraged, absolutely outraged, which is kind of funny, because when Apple was a notoriously closed uh, company. In fact, my, my son has a t-shirt that says, I visited the Apple campus, but that's all I'm allowed to tell you. Um, they released about 5% of their source code, and everybody went, oh, wonderful, Apple's going open. Right? MakerBot took about 5% of their source code private. Everybody went, ah, hate, hate, hate. So this is, is kind of weird, but um, uh, MakerBot got bought out by Stratasys, who was one of the, the originators, one of the, the first patents. Uh, was filed by Stratasys back in the mid 80s and so it's kind of ironic that they absorbed MakerBot and MakerBot is now a brand. It's kind of their low end. Stratasys for, for decades has made very high end, very expensive, very large, very capable machines. We're talking thirty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 pop as opposed to, that was I think 2500 when we bought it. And now for around 100 bucks, you can get an entry level machine at Home Depot. So the technology is, has really uh, become more, uh, uh, more accessible. So uh, within the last five years or so, there's been a lot of growth, a lot of consolidation. Uh, so the kinds of 3D printers, the kinds of technology, there are three basic kinds, although there's lots and lots of options in there. This is called an FDM, or um, fused deposition modeling. It, it squeezes out melted plastic, like toothpaste out of a tube, and builds it up layer by layer by layer. And there's all kinds of different materials that you can feed into that thing. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Then there's laser sintering, where you have a powder, typically of metal, although you can also have, have nylon, um, and it's fused by a laser, essentially welding the, the, the particles together. And what's neat about that is you can change the metal partway through the build. And so you can build, say, a turbine blade for a jet engine that's stainless steel at the hub, where you need a lot of tensile strength, and then it transitions to titanium, which has a high heat resistance. So that's really, really neat. And try to manufacture that by any other means would be just ridiculously expensive. But because it's a computer file, you can replicate it over and over and over again and just set the machines up and they go. And you just kind of have to keep them fed and supplied with material. Um, there's another kind of sintering that uses a plastic material where essentially an inkjet moves across in X and Y and, and uh, prints a, uh, uh, a solvent to fuse the plastic particles together. And that's kind of neat. Then the third kind is uh, what we talked about before, the, uh, the stereolithography, where you have a laser beam that catalyzes a liquid resin and solidifies it. And you can get some very high resolution prints uh, uh, in, in that regard. Um, yeah? When you do the, uh, the metal you talked about, so you want to go from steel to titanium, <laughs> will it morph, or will there be a line? This is steel and this is titanium, or are you going to start doing an alloy in between? It depends on how you want to design it. And it's, 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 that's an engineering question, and depends on, on how you set it up. I just what they do. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and, and I'm not exactly certain to tell you the truth. Um, so there's all kinds of different kinds of extruded materials for, for the FDM. 
kind of machine. Um, this machine uses uh, uh, styrene plastic, which is the same stuff they make Legos out of and, and model airplane parts and things like that. Uh, there's also a, a resin called PLA, which is biodegradable. It's essentially a, a corn, modified corn. Um, there are metallic plastics, where you've got metallic powder that's embedded into the plastic matrix. And the resulting part, you can actually treat like metal. You can polish it, you can cut it, you can shape it. It will tarnish. Uh, you print the copper, and it'll get that nice green verdigris, um, which is really kind of neat. They even have wood with wood fibers embedded in it. And you can treat that like a wooden object, even though it's got this fantastic shape that you could not carve out of wood. But you can sand it and polish it and varnish it and, and do anything you would with, with wood. Um, there's flexible materials. So you can like print a running shoe. Custom print your own running shoe. Uh, water solubly, we talked about, it's concrete. There's a fellow in Minnesota built a very large 3D printer and printed a castle for his kids to play in, in his backyard, out of concrete. And there's a hotel, I think in Guatemala, Guam maybe? There's a hotel that was 3D printed in concrete. Um, you can sort of print food. I've, I've seen it done. There's, there's this, a guy developed a machine that would print a pizza. What the point of that is, I think, was just to be able to say that you could 3D print a pizza. But um, pretty much anything you can squirt out of a nozzle, uh, you can print. Um, we're even printing tissue. Uh, they're printing uh, autograph, autographed skin for burn victims. So they'll, you know, let's say you've, you've got a significant burn, they'll take tissue, they'll take your skin, grow it in a lab, and then print a new sheet of skin. So there's no chance of rejection. At Carnegie Mellon, a team has said that they figured out how to print a capillary network, which means we're that close to being able to 3D print tissue and organs. And imagine if you could get to the point where you could print a kidney and take somebody off the transplant waiting list. And that's what they're starting out with, actually, is, is kidneys. Because kidneys are fantastically crazy complex. And if you can print a kidney, you can print just about anything else, short of brain tissue, probably. Um, electronic circuits can be printed. Uh, there's all kinds of things with that kind of machine that extrudes it one layer at a time. So this is what a, a resin printer looks like. Um, and uh, the reason for the orange plastic is because it's an ultraviolet laser. And so the orange would absorb the UV and, and protect your eyes from any stray laser radiation. Uh, but there you have a tray of liquid resin. And it's transparent. The laser beam shoots up from underneath it. And then the build happens upside down. So it moves in a positive Z direction and builds it one layer at a time because the, the laser beam is focused at the surface and uh, the, I think it's the presence of oxygen that helps to catalyze the resin and solidify it. Uh, this is the sintering. And so what this does is you can see that you have the powder and the laser beam welds the things together. And then you just push another layer across. And so the build itself drops down. And then once it's done, it, it, it you know, will emerge like you know, the Lady of the Lake in Excalibur. And then here's that concrete printer. You can see it's just the same idea, just a slightly larger scale. And there the challenge, of course, is to, to keep it, you know, supplied. So what's the process? So first you create a 3D model. You can use Autodesk or SketchUp or Tinkercad or, or any of a number of software packages that creates a standard software file, a, a standard uh, 3D file. Um, you can download it. There's a whole bunch of places online where you can download, excuse me, download things that people have uh, uploaded for free. And then you convert the model to G-code because the 3D model is a set of XYZ points. And what you need to do is translate that into a tool path, into a path for each layer. And there is a, uh, uh, a tool called uh, Skineforge that does that and does that automatically. It figures it out. And then you build the G-code. Now, G-code is an industry standard um, CNC control language. It has additional uh, commands added for additive printing. So commands to turn on the extruder, to heat up the build platform, things like that. Whereas your standard uh, G-code would have things like um, 
uh, how fast is your, your feed rate for your, your tool head and what's your RPM and things like that. Um, and then you convert the G code to a printer specific code. For this machine, it's called an S3G file. And uh, then you send the code to the printer. So the software looks like this. And you convert it to G code. Yeah, I'm going to save the model. Come on. So here, it lets me set a bunch of different parameters. I can set how much infill there is. And if you look at some of the models that are, are partially complete, you can see kind of a, a honeycomb pattern on the inside. So it takes up less plastic, it builds faster. Um, what the feed rate is, whether I'm going to use the left or the right, if I'm going to put a platform underneath it, if I'm going to use support, and the machine figures all that out. And then it'll send it to the, uh, to the printer. I can either save that on an SD card, which is what that's printing off now, or I could actually hook it up via USB. And then you just print it. And uh, even something simple takes a while. So this little uh, Atom, uh, uh, I think the name of the file is Science Necklace. It's a, a generic Atom model. You know, it takes 15, 20 minutes to print one out. And that's a little bitty thing. Uh, this planet Earth over here, um, that's about a four hour build. And I've had things like uh, literally take overnight. But still faster than you could do it by hand. Um, so this is a piece I did several years ago. My daughter was in a high school musical, um, uh, Schoolhouse Rock Live. And I'm talking with the director about ways I might be able to help out and contribute. And uh, he's saying, well, I'd, I'd, I'd like a costume. I need a couple costumes. Um, and he showed me the, the, the book. And it had for the sun in the Interplanet Janet uh, sequence, uh, kind of a Statue of Liberty thing with a glittery crown and a bathing beauty ribbon that said the sun. He said, this is really boring. I want something. So I said, you want Vega Showgirl, right? Yeah. So I designed this, essentially a shoulder harness out of some scrap aluminum I had. And I designed these two pieces to go on the shoulders and hold at 90 degree angles some wooden sticks. It went up and went out to the side with a wire across the top and that fabulous gold lame fabric sewn to it uh, for the upper arc with a slot cut for the head and then a poncho for the rest of it. It could be put on or taken off in seconds. It was lightweight, would last through two dress rehearsals and five performances. And that's all it needed to last. Um, and so that thing was just pop riveted on to, uh, to the aluminum. But could I have done that you know, in a wood shop or in a metal shop? Yeah, sure. But I was also able to do it just printing it out and tinkering with it. And one of them is, is around here, one of the, the first iterations. I uh, added the cutouts there to speed up the build process. That saved me about half an hour by not printing those little semicircular bits. And I tell you, when, uh, when that girl walked out on stage and the spotlight hit her, you knew it was the sun. There was no introduction necessary. Uh, it really looked great on stage. Um, so here's a sample of what uh, G-code looks like. As you can see, it uh, looks an awful lot like gobbledygook. Most of it is uh, XYZ coordinates. And it's page after page after page. You can, you can have four or five megabytes of text. That's a lot of text. And yes, you could edit it by hand if you dared. I don't. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that's what it looks like. Um, so where can we go with this? What can we do? Well, uh, 3D printing is used a great deal for rapid prototyping. So an engineer can, in the space of a few hours, for less than a dollar in materials, have a part that he can hand a customer or try on to another piece and see if it fits and play around with, OK, well, I need to add a tab here, or I need to cut out here. Or, this needs to be slightly different shape and very quickly prototype things that would be uh, very expensive to do any other way. You can do small production runs. So if you hand me a 3D file, I can print you out five of them. Whereas any other manufacturing technique, it would cost thousands of dollars to set up the machines uh, to, to create them. Whereas uh, if there's a 3D file, boom, you can just send it to the printer. Um, you can deliver parts at a distance. I remember my, my car broke down. 
uh, when I was down in Strongsville a couple years ago. And I desperately wished that they'd had a 3D printer because we could have just printed out the part right there. They didn't have it in stock. We could have just printed it out. So I wound up just using a hose clamp and um, it's been fine ever since. I mean, sometimes low tech solutions work just fine. But um, you can deliver parts at a distance. A couple of years ago, uh, the International Space Station needed a particular wrench to fix a, a piece that had broken. And it would have taken two years to get that tool on the manifest for a resupply ship. They emailed the wrench to the space station and printed it out on orbit. And within a day, they uh, were back in operation. Um, you could imagine disaster relief, being able to 3D print shelters in a, uh, an, an earthquake zone or a, or a, a flood zone. Um, what we're doing right now is we're printing replacement bone and cartilage uh, from your own cells, so there's no risk of rejection. And so, let's say somebody has had, you know, lost a piece of their jaw to an accident or cancer surgery, something like that, they can design the part, print it in bone cell, implant it, and then your own living bone will grow into that matrix. And there is no risk of rejection because it's your own tissue. Um, replacement organs, someday. Um, yes, you can print a working firearm. That genie is out of the bottle. Thingiverse will not host it. Uh, Google uh, SketchUp 3D Warehouse will not host it. But those files are out there and it can be done. Uh, the options for jewelry, art, and design, they're clothing designers that are printing things that cannot be manufactured any other way. Um, really, really cool. There's a, even a 3D pen that you can like sculpt in, in, in space. It just extrudes the plastic. You just keep feeding it in. Uh, architecture, civil engineering, you know, and someday, you know, Captain Picard, T, Earl Grey, hot, and there it is. Who knows where things are going? Uh, we are really early days of this, te this, this technology, and uh, the sky is literally the limit. Your imagination is literally the limit. That's what I got. Now, Marty, you've been using this in your classes. So how are you using it in your classroom? Um, well, we use SolidWorks. So the students practically, every uh, mechanical and manufacturing student knows SolidWorks. Mm -hmm. So they can take SolidWorks and um, take it right straight to uh, the 3D printer, because uh, SolidWorks can make STL files and do that and um, so we're using it in our uh, capstone class to make prototypes so that way they can look at it and see how does it fit what's the size mm -hmm. uh, how does the handle look how does the grip feel that type of a thing uh, and then they can just really quickly just change it mm -hmm. um, and then also trying to, to, to play around with getting things to print properly is always a trick yep um, you could use it like in a strength and materials class to demonstrate uh, strength and materials concepts because theoretically, um, you know, something like a tube will have 75% of the strength of a solid rod, but about 50% of the, of the weight. So mm -hmm. you could do that by changing the amount of shells right. in it with about 10% of the fill versus, and then you can make a solid rod and test it that way in bending. So those are other things that can be done with it uh, from an educational point of view. So, um, so that's a really neat thing. I found a downloaded a tensile sample. So I use that to break it with different shells. Uh, and then also the way you print it, if you print it horizontally versus vertically, it makes a very big difference in the strength. Sure. Because if you print it horizontally, the layers um, are one way, but if you print it vertically, you have the individual layers going up, so you have different, um, it's not as uh, cohesive, and it's, it's easy to break in between Easier pull apart, right. You print it vertically. Right, wood grain. Yeah, and, and your shear strength would be very different depending on right. um, what orientation you had printed in. So it's, it's little things like that from a more of a theoretical uh, structure point of view. Cool. Uh, ways of using it uh, in the classroom right now. Great. Is SolidWorks, does the college have a license for it, or is it free, or is it? Oh, we, we teach three different levels of classes for it, and we've got 
SOLIDWORKS loaded in, I think, like three or four classrooms. So we teach intro, and then we teach advanced, and then we have a higher level SOLIDWORKS class. So, but it's expensive piece of software like MATLAB or something? Or is it uh, you can get a student version for like 99 bucks, okay. but um, I think we have an institutional license for it. Well, that's yeah. Awesome. yeah. Yeah, and it's, in this, it's industry standard. Tool. Yeah, I mean, okay. everyone, in fact, it's getting to the point where we're talking about not even teaching uh, AutoCAD 2D. And just not even doing it. I have a student who wants to do his Calc 3 project. He has a 3D printer at home. Mm -hmm. So this was very time <laughs> just to, to learn a little more about it because I, yeah. like I said, but, but maybe you should use SOLIDWORKS. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, find out. Yeah, it's not a, not a difficult software to learn. And we've got some phenomenal teachers. Uh, yeah. It's a, a great, great tool. I mean, it, you know, just learning that alone will help help uh, make, make someone uh, value, value added to the local industries. Yeah. If a program like Form Z that you would use for architectural models, mm -hmm. you could still use that just as long as you can make the G code out of it. Oh, sure. Yeah, if, if, if it'll output a standard 3D file, mm -hmm. you know, at .obg or .stl, you can bring it into uh, Replicator G or, or any other uh, um, software tool that, that talks to 3D printers. And so you could you know, design your room and scale it down and print it out and show it to a client. And say, uh, this, is, you know, this is the design you talked about. Is this really what you want? <laughs> well, Brad, Corey, the program that his son is in does that routinely. Yeah. Uh, in fact, they're designing a shopping center to be built in Mayfield High School, in a garage in Mayfield High School. And they do that all, all on the 3D printer. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. He, yeah. Zach's learning the solid works now. Yeah. And they've got a they've got a really nice little maker space down there. They have a bunch of 3D printers. Uh, uh, they got uh, computer controlled routers, lathe, uh, laser engravers. Uh, it's a it's a really nice little program. And they've got like 98 percent of their students, uh, you know, either going to a four year school or get a job or going to the military right off the bat. Or come here. <laughs> yep. So when you say lathe, is it an additive lathe? No, it's, no. A, it's subtractive, okay. but it's computer controlled. But do they have additive lathes, which would, instead of, you know, here we're moving in a Z axis direction, mm -hmm. you could picture where you build the layer, layer and then push it out, and then you build the layer. And no, layer. It's, it's a traditional yeah. lathe like what we have here in our shop. But do they have this kind of thing or no? No, the, the thing that you described doesn't really exist. Okay. Because the, the the plastic would have to stretch have to bigger stretch and bigger and bigger. So now you just uh, just print out a layer and then print out another layer, and so you can see the, the little uh, 3D knot, the spiral knot thing, you know, taking shape there. Well, thanks for coming, folks. Appreciate it. Thank Phil, thank you. Diana, thanks for setting it up, making it happen. Thanks. Mm -hmm.